Okay, we're recording. Uh, I'm Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College. Today I'm joined by Lee Cray, Assistant Professor at Texas Christian University and David Friedel at Union College. Uh, thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. So we're gonna talk about the metaphysics of fictional characters. And so the first um, issue that we're gonna discuss is characters who have inconsistent stories, right? Or, in, or inconsistent properties, right? That seem to have contradictory properties. And so characters that have you know, developed over time, characters like comic book characters, such as Spider-Man or Superman or Batman that have been taken up by numerous authors over time, whose stories have changed over time where you know, they've been, their pasts have been revisited and tinkered with by different authors over time or perhaps by one author over time. Um, what should we make of these characters, right? It doesn't seem true that, you know, a, a character with an unstable history of that sort is the same over time. So, so Lee, I think we'll kick it to you first. So what do you have to say about cases of this sort? Yeah, I think cases like that are really cool. Um, so yeah, look at Batman, right? There have been probably more stories told about Batman than almost any other fictional character, maybe any other fictional character, you know, because Batman is this transmedia franchise, shows up in comics, films, television shows, theatrical serials, video games, it's even novels, like Batman is everywhere. And the stories are, you know, as you point out, radically inconsistent, right? So, let's simplify things by just focusing on the comics for now um because it's pretty clear that the batman like cinematic stuff or the video games are supposed to take place in their own kind of little compartmentalized worlds right let's just talk about the, the comics well i mean there's a sense in which the character is inconsistent over time and there's a sense in which the character isn't inconsistent over time right so a lot of folks help themselves to this distinction between internal and external properties. They might call it different uh, by different names, but you know, the external properties are the properties that are true of the character as, as an object, like as a, as a legally sort of um, ownable uh, storytelling tool, right? And those properties are consistent, you know, Batman created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger shows up in all these stories, uh, is not as old as the character of Superman, uh, is cooler than Spider-Man, all, all of these properties. But those are external properties. But Batman also has internal properties, right? And internal properties are the properties that are true according to the fiction. So Batman is a man. Batman is a human. Batman dresses as a bat. Batman doesn't kill. These are internal properties, right? And when we say, you know, Batman dresses as a bat, that's really short for, according to the Batman story, Batman dresses as a bat, right? And that claim's true, but that's less a claim about Batman as it is about the Batman stories. Right? Now, I mentioned Batman doesn't kill. Right? But in early Batman comics, he does, right? This is, I think, one of the most glaringly inconsistent properties because it's been, especially in the last several decades, really emphasized that Batman does not kill. It's part of his code. It's inviolable. But in the beginning, he certainly had no problem with it in the stories. Now, I don't think that sort of contradiction generates like logical problems because I mean, fictional worlds aren't governed by the law of non-contradiction and the law of excluded middle, right? Why? Because they're not discovered. They're, they're constructed, right? So they don't need to be consistent or complete like we would expect the actual world to be, right? These fictional worlds are discovered and there's gluts and gaps and inconsistencies all over the place in most fictions, right? So I don't think the very fact that there are incompatible properties ascribed to Batman over time makes the character, um, makes it a different character. It's just the same storytelling tool being described in different ways. 
I do think that it raises questions for interpretation and continuity in the story though. Like, what do we, how do we make sense of Batman's oath given that he is sort of in panel shown killing people? I think that's a really interesting question, but I talked a lot to answer that. So I wanna, um, David, did, did what I just say sound false? No, um, I was hoping we would have some disagreement, but I think everything you said sounds true. Yeah. Um, I'll just maybe give an analogy to I think support this way of thinking about Batman. Um, you know, imagine instead of we had inconsistent stories about a fictional character, we had inconsistent stories about a real person, right? So, um, you know, um, you could have a story according to which Elizabeth Warren is like a violinist. Um, you could have a story about Elizabeth Warren according to which she's not a violinist. Um, both stories are still about Elizabeth Warren. Um, you know, this can happen with fictional stories. It can happen with rumors. Um, I think, yeah, you know, Lee and I would agree that there's, these are just different competing stories about the same individual. Um, likewise, you could have different stories about Batman. Um, that, that, that's consistent with, with at least my ontological views about fictional characters. So I think I'm, I'm following Amy Thomason here and thinking that fictional characters, they're not like sets of properties even. Um, I, I, um, Thomason isn't as explicit about this as, 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 as maybe um, she could have been, but I think her view is that um, fictional characters don't really have any parts and they're not made of properties. So they're really just kind of these placeholders, these things that we talk about when we're telling stories. And there's no reason why one person could describe, could, there's, there's no reason why one person couldn't describe um, this fictional character as killing and then in a later story um, say that they don't. Just like there's nothing to stop someone from saying that Elizabeth Warren plays the violin and somebody else saying that she doesn't. Um, it's still about Elizabeth Warren, it's still about Batman. Is there a difference though between those two cases in the sense that Elizabeth Warren exists independently of the stories about her, whereas Batman exists seemingly dependently on the stories about him. Yeah, I would disagree with that. Um, Good. I go against the grain here, and I think that, I mean, a lot of folks in print have argued or asserted that fictional characters depend on fictional works for their existence, but I think it's independent. I mean, Batman was created before there were any Batman stories, right? And a lot of characters, especially in comics or anyone who's ever played Dungeons and Dragons, like I've generated so many characters that have never had stories told about them. And I think that they are ontologically speaking, genuinely fictional characters. Um, I think in some cases we write stories and we create characters as we go right, which might give us the idea that the character is dependent on the story, but really it's a concurrent tool built as a problem solving device for this other project you're building, right? But I do think that there's something to this. So like, what is true of Batman now is not what was true of Batman when Bill Kane and, and when Bob Kane and Bill Finger created the character, right? Characters morphed, characters evolved and gone well beyond the properties that they ascribed, right? And I think the way we explain that is through this large, messy, social, sociological um, collaborative game of, of canon, right? Where copyright holders dictate canon for copyrighted stories, like what's canonical, what's not, but their decisions can be swayed by input from fans, by critical successes and failures and so on and so forth. And by, you know, hiring of new writers and giving them creative license to, to do new things. So the way I see it, what's true of Batman is kind of this emergent fact, like what's true internally of Batman, what's true in the story of Batman. Um, is this kind of emergent fact based on a lot of like collaborative agreement by 
by copyright holders, editors, publishers, authors, uh, fans, and critics, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I don't think we can figure out whether Batman kills or not just by reading stories in isolation. We need to look at the broader Batman system. Yeah. David, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I, since Lee and I are agreeing so much, I, maybe I should give voice to some people who would disagree or at least potential disagreement. So say if you're a Platonist about fictional characters, so you think they exist eternally, they're not the sort of thing that's constructed or created by authors. Um, it's natural, I think, there to think that a fictional character is maybe a set of properties. And then these, I think these cases, I don't know if they'll pose problems, but at least different questions, because then you there, there might be a real question about which set of properties are we referring to when we use the name Batman, right? So on, on my view, we don't really, you don't have that problem you might, it, it, there still might be this question that Lee was alluding to about like, what's true of the, the character in the story. But like, we're talking about Batman, no matter what we're ascribing to Batman, just like we're talking about Elizabeth Warren, no matter what we're ascribing to her. But, but if you're a Platonist who thinks that, that there's a, that the characters are say a, an, an eternal set of properties, then I think, then I think there is a real question about what are we referring to when we use the name Batman? Are there different Batmans um, again, I don't, th I don't think that's necessarily an objection or, or a problem, but it's at least a different set of questions that Platonists will have to think about. So in the spirit of disagreement, um, so I'm no Platonist. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I think idealism of a sort is the way to go for fictional characters. But on that view, the, the content of the idea that is Batman is basically like a set of properties. So it has that in common with Platonism. And I think we're okay. running the same problem. But I don't think it's a problem. Um, I think the Platonist and the idealist have a solution to that. I think when the character is first created, it might be a set of properties for the Platonist or an idea that has as its content a set of properties for the idealist. But then it has an identity. It's a thing, right? We've, we've, um, indicated it, if you will. But then we can ascribe to it any properties we want. Right? Let's say I, I create a character and, you know, part of the creation of the character, let's say I'm a Platonist who thinks that they're, pre, they're eternally existing sets of properties and creation is discovery of the relevant set. And I, I, cre I create a character that is, I don't know, has the properties of being an Italian plumber who wears blue overalls and a red cap, right? And I call him, uh, I don't know, George. Um, <laughs> so that's a set of properties on the plainest view or on the idealist view. It's an idea that has as its content a set of properties. But then now we've got George. Now George is a, is a thing, right? George is part of the discourse. George is accepted as a storytelling tool. And I decide, I like George, but I don't like any of those properties. So I'm just gonna ascribe in stories I tell about George, radically different properties. George is um, a German carpenter who wears red overalls and his name is not George anymore, it's Mario, right? So I think we don't need to be, be beholden to the, the in, when it comes to internal property descriptions to the properties that are like, as it were, like part of the identity of the character. But on, on your view, um, it would still be the same character? Yeah, because it's the, the thing that we're ascribing the properties to. Right. Right. Now, I do think, though, that there are rules. Um, like, with Batman, I can't tell a story about Batman, according to which Batman is an Italian plumber uh, named George. Right. And I think that has to do with the, the messy, collaborative, uh, social stuff I was mentioning earlier. I think like I would have counted as failing to use that character in the story because no one would ever recognize that I had been trying to unless I told them. Right. So I think it counts as like a misuse or a failure to use the character in that case. Oh, interesting. We, because my view would be that if you secretively do that, then you get away with it. You're, you're right. The fans might never know that yeah. they're actually reading a story. 
about Batman. Um, mm-hmm. But on my, I mean, maybe you've, I would say your failure there is maybe aesthetic or something like that. But I, like you, I think you can successfully tell such a story. Is, is your read that you, re- that you really can't even tell such a story and refer to Batman? I mean, I mean, there, there's vagueness issues here, right? Um, but I think there are paradigm cases of stories we could tell where you would read them, never believe that it was intended to be a Batman story. Mm-hmm. And then if the creator came to you and said, oh yeah, I was secretly intending that to be Batman. I think the proper response is, well, you failed. You're in t- you didn't follow through on your intention. Um, because I think, I mean, I see, I think your view is a little simpler in some ways, but in other ways, like suppose I pick up Scott Snyder's run on Batman, which I have right here behind me and I read it and I'm like, this is so good. It's one of the greatest Batman stories of all time, blah, blah, blah. But then like I, I read a, a secret interview with Scott Snyder. He didn't know he was being recorded. And he's like, yeah, I tricked him. That wasn't really a Batman story. I was intending to tell a story about about uh, Elizabeth Warren, mm-hmm. and uh, I just described her a bunch of other properties so that people would think I was telling a Batman story, and no one gets it. That's my big joke on the world. I yeah. just I think that's a that possibility that he could be right on that strikes me as a strike against that view. Oh, but, I see. Um, um, I'm I'm happy to bite the bullet there, and uh, think that. Um, yeah, the, the, it's actually a story about Elizabeth Warren, but it's fine if the fans want to like treat it as a Batman story and accept it into the canon of Batman, but um, that unbeknownst to the fans, it, this, this story is actually about Elizabeth Warren. Um, yeah, think- so well, I'm glad we found a disagreement. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I want to push back on you again. On yeah. That's okay, Brandon. Are we are we following? No, by all means, push back. Would in that case, suppose um, Elizabeth Warren hears this leak, leaked interview by Scott Snyder, and finds out that the whole New Fifty Two Batman run was actually about her. Yeah. Uh, does she have um, legal options? Can she sue? For, for like defamation or something like that. Or like usage of her character. Um, oh. because I would, I, think, I would think she wouldn't have a case it would strike me that like or someone couldn't get around using Batman uh, by saying that it's not Batman it's a different character oh I agree um, but this is where I think probably the law the law is different just from our metaphysics and philosophy of language but mm-hmm. I don't think we should read too much into into yeah. the what we would do legally because um, I agree it I don't think you could. I don't think you could um, try to sell these stories and claim that you're not um, telling Batman stories. That you're instead telling was Elizabeth Warren stories. Yeah. Because even though literally you are, I agree. There, like that would not be a good legal practice. But. Well, I think I think we've got a methodological disagreement there. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think when we're doing the ontology of fictional characters or an ontology of any any like art adjacent object. We need to be somewhat beholden to our data set, which is like the practice. And the practice is multifaceted and part of the practice is uh, the legal aspects of it. So I think that counts as data. Um, And I think it just like we need to make sense of the talk of artists and critics, like making sense of court decisions and and copyright law and stuff like that. Um, I mean, which of course poses problems from my own view because like you can't own an idea. Um, so like if I think fictional right. characters are ideas, I gotta say something, right? So I don't think, I think this is like a problem. I think, I think it's, it's, it's something that um, Darren Hick and various other folks have really emphasized. And I think like, I think it's worth listening to. Yeah. I, can, I have one case that maybe I think hopefully supports my view, which is that imagine it's, it's not like you're trying to play this weird trick, but imagine you're like, a bizarre conspiracy theorist who, and you know, there are conspiracy theorists out there who believe strange things about certain politicians. Just imagine that there's one who believes that Elizabeth Warren dresses up as a bat and, you know, fights crime at night 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they, you know, I think they're, they, they are there. It's intuitive that they're, they're writing the story about Elizabeth Warren. And I don't see why, you know, I don't see an obvious reason why it wouldn't be true in the other case. Well, I mean, suppose I tell a story about Elizabeth Warren where um, she was born in Gotham City as a boy named Bruce to the parents, Bruce, uh, Thomas and Martha Wayne. She watched them be murdered. Um, and when she became a young man, uh, she took a vow. Um, never really got into politics. It's like, I'm not talking about Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> sure. I, I, I mean, I think the conspiracy theorist is thinking about Elizabeth Warren or whatever politician they're thinking about. They might just have radically, you know, wildly implausible views about the person. Um, you know, there, there are people who think uh, Donald Trump is protecting all of us from a secret uh, cabal of pedophiles in Washington, D.C. I think they're having genuine beliefs about Donald Trump. Um, so, Yeah. Hmm. David, so in, in your view, when would someone fail to realize their intention? Ah. And I think we'll end it with that question. Yeah, because I, I don't have an answer, so save by the bell. <laughs> no answer. Okay, so I guess next time we can talk about when do we get multiple bat men <laughs> instead of one bat man. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both.